Good morning and welcome to another online Awaken Sermon. Today's sermon is called Rest. And this sermon begins with a story. Because this is a story that still to this day haunts me. When I was 16 years old, the summer of my 16th year, I got my first job. And I began working as the cleanup crew, <laughs> uh, a one-man crew. I did all the odds and ends work, all the grunt work at a car garage in Chappaqua, New York. So I would do things uh, like I would take the garbage out, I would paint the shop walls, I would clean up whenever there was a mess made in the shop. I would run whatever errands had to be run. So one hot summer afternoon, very similar to today, which basically seems to be every single day this summer, does it not? There was an errand that my boss wanted me to run. He wanted me to take this old shop pickup, this beaten down pickup truck, fill the bed with all of the dirty shop laundry, cloths, clothing, throw it all into the back of the bed of this pickup truck, and then drive it up the street to the laundromat where he wanted me to clean all the laundry. Sounds like a fun job, right? Yeah, I thought so. Now, before I left, he gave me one piece of advice. He told me, because this was the first time that I had ever driven the shop pickup truck. He said, hey, just so you know, the gas gauge on the pickup truck is broken. It doesn't work. So you won't know how low you are on fuel. Make sure that you fill up the pickup with fuel when you get to Mount Kisco. I drive from the shop in Chappaqua up 117, maybe you know the road, get to Mount Kisco, go to the laundromat, clean all the clothes, wait there the whole time, then I drive back. Now what did I forget to do? <laughs> go to the gas station. What do you think happens next in this story? I break down. And not just break down, we're talking, here I am driving 117, which is a very narrow two-lane road, and it's very windy with a whole bunch of hills and blind curves. Where do I happen to break down? At the top of a mini hill right in the middle of a blind curve. Like literally, it's an S curve and right in the middle of that S is where the truck as it's slightly going uphill decides to just completely sputter out. I have no idea what's going on. I'm a new driver. I've been driving for less than a year. I'm in a pickup truck uh, that I'm pretty uncomfortable driving. I'm hitting the gas, pressing it to the floor, the truck is going nowhere. I have a whole line of cars behind me. I start freaking out. Eventually, I get out of the pickup truck. I didn't have a cell phone at this point. All right, this was like pre-everyone having a cell phone, pre-every 16-year-old, every 9-year-old having a cell phone. I have to go knock on the window of the guy behind me. And I'm like, hey, do you have a phone that I can borrow? You know what his response was? Who do you want to call? Who do I want to call? I want to order a pizza. Who do you think I want to call? I need to get some help here. I'm stuck in the middle of the road. To make it even worse, as the cars started to go around me, there were cars coming in the other direction, and the whole time I was waiting, because the guy eventually let me use his phone. I called the shop. They said they would send someone. But the whole time that I was waiting, and I got as far off the road as I possibly could, I kept hearing the screeching of brakes. People were yelling at me. Uh, I mean... I really thought there was going to be an accident. This, for a 16-year-old, this was pretty bad. And I'm telling you, whenever I drive through that spot, and I actually do on a pretty regular basis on 117, whenever I drive around that turn, my heart starts beating a little quicker. <laughs> I go back to that moment about 20 years ago and it vividly, the memory of it vividly comes back to me. All because I didn't fill up 
the truck with gas. The gauges, the gas gauge was broken and that thing had nothing left in the tank. Now, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because for me, it's kind of what it feels like right now. <laughs> it feels like there's very little in the tank. Now, for us humans, we don't have gauges that tell us how much fuel we have left. Uh, there's no gauges to tell us the temperature, or well, I guess you have a thermometer for that, but we don't have the gauges on our dashboard that we're constantly monitoring to tell us the condition or the health of the car that we're driving. What we have, we have feelings. We have just the feeling of being depleted or the feeling of being full. And I don't know about you, but these past couple of months, they've taken their toll on me a bit. And it's, it's not even, yes, it's the normal wear and tear uh, that's put on your body as you do work and all the normal things that you do in life, but there's the emotional wear and tear that we've all been through over the past couple of months. And the emotional wear and tear of the uncertainty of the future, right? Because nothing's been resolved yet. And we're still, we're kind of in this limbo state right now. We know what's happened over the past couple of months, or at least we have some sort of an idea what's happened, but obviously that changes depending on who you've spoken with. But where are things going to go? What will happen over the next two months, five months, six months, the next year? I mean, people have all sorts of different predictions about how long this way of living will last. We have some idea of what school is going to look, look like for our children, but what if things take a different turn? Are, are we going to be right back to where we were a couple of weeks, months ago? So there's the emotional toll that the past, the recent past, has taken on us. But then there's also the emotional toll of the future as well. Now for me, one of the ways to combat the normal wear and tear that you acquire throughout life is a weekly practice known as Sabbath. Early on, when the coronavirus first struck, Steph and I were talking, and one of the things we realized right from the beginning was we were going to need very set and intentional rhythms. In order to not just completely lose yourself, completely go crazy, there were going to need to be particular rhythms that you engaged in. This was time for work. Uh, this was time to exercise. This was time to shut it all down completely. For me, Friday is my Sabbath. It's the day I don't open up my computer. I don't check my email. I limit my phone as much as I possibly can. Screen time, I try to limit all of it. Now, over the past couple of months, Fridays, because things take a little bit longer right now, right? You go to the grocery store and it's taken a bit longer to get through all of the errands. So Fridays haven't been as, because the other thing about it too is normally you go to the grocery store, I don't mind going to the grocery store. It's kind of fun for me, throwing all the food in there and dreaming about what you're gonna make for the week ahead, right? And dreaming about all the great recipes that you're going to make or your wife is going to make. But recently, you go to the grocery store and you put on a mask and everyone else has a mask around you. There's a glass partition between you and the cashier. That takes its toll on you as well, psychologically. Whether you realize it or not, walking around in a store where everyone is wearing masks and where there's a partition between you and the cashier, I mean, that, that does something to you. That weighs on you. It's not normal. 
It's not what we're used to. Our minds, our brains know that there's something else going on. And so Fridays, uh, they've been a, for me, such a life-giving day. Recently, they, they've been a little more taxing. They've been a little more draining. Maybe, maybe the same is true for you as well. You have a day, um, you have some time where you do nothing, where you rest, you engage in Sabbath. But recently, with all the emotional energy that goes into everything, you don't feel as rested as you used to feel. Am I alone in this? Or am I the only one? Or are you feeling this too? <laughs> Yeah. So Sabbath, which so necessary, so important, so integral for me and my life and living from a full bucket where the gas gauges aren't completely or where the gas tank isn't completely drained. It's just not having the same effect that it used to have. Now, I would have this weekly practice of Sabbath, but then I would also have throughout the year moments when I would have sort of a lengthened Sabbath, a Sabbath, a prolonged Sabbath, a few days of Sabbath strung together, otherwise known as vacation. And this is so important for our health, taking time off, taking time to shut it all down, to not be staring at a screen, to not be thinking about your work, to not have to engage your mental capacities. On Sabbath, for me, and during a vacation, I read almost no book related to work at all. There is no theology books being read. It's simply fiction, fun reading, reading that takes me to some far off land or some far distant place where I can escape for a moment. Now, one of the, uh, what I want to do is I want to actually give you three Bible verses about this idea of rest. So we've been talking about Sabbath. Here's Mark chapter 2, verse 27. And here's Jesus speaking to his disciples. They're talking about Sabbath and what can you do, what can't you do on the Sabbath. They turned it into a whole bunch of legalities. And Jesus, he's starting to get annoyed at this. He said, you're missing the point. You're missing what Sabbath is all about. It's not what you can do versus what you can't do. Sabbath, you're not, you're not supposed to nitpick because that in itself is draining. He says this, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man the Sabbath. Sabbath, a day of rest, a day of, let's call it refilling, so that you don't break down in the middle of an S turn on 117. It's for us. <laughs> Sabbath was made for humanity. Yeah, it's a gift. It's a gift. Go back to this whole idea of it's something we receive something that is graciously being given to us. Because the other six days, you work, you sweat, you toil. There's plenty to be done in those other six days. But for one day, one day, a gift is being handed to you. A gift where you realize the world will still spin without you you realize things will still continue. You can rest, you can cease, you can stop for a day, and life will continue. Sabbath is a day. The way I like to say it, Sabbath is a day to play. Vacation, it's a time, an important time to play. <laughs> so ask yourself, what would most fill my soul? For some of you, um, you want to get on a boat. You want to go fishing. For others, you want to sit on the back patio. You want to barbecue. 
you want to read, uh, you want to catch some rays. Others, you want to sit on a beach. Others, you want to go for a hike. You want to be out in nature and just enjoy the woods and trails and solitude. Sabbath was made for humanity. What is it that will most fill your soul? That is the gift of Sabbath. Because when you play, when you do that which will most fill your soul, you come alive again. You're pouring gas back in the tank, and then you're ready to re-engage. We need you. We need all of us, myself included. See, Sabbath, it's not just for me. Rest, it's, yes, it's for me, but it's for all of us because when I give a sermon, you want a sermon to come from a life-giving place. You don't want a sermon to come from someone who, whose energy levels are completely depleted. Uh, there was one I was say, seminar, there was one course I took, and it was called Something to Say. And the whole premise of it was you want to have something to say rather than having to say something. And what is it? that causes that shift, it's rest. It's living from a place of fullness. Now let's look to, uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Here's one of my other all time, or actually no, I'm sorry. We're gonna go, we're gonna go old school for a moment. Let's first go to Psalms chapter 23. One of my all time favorite psalms probably for many of you uh, this is one of your favorite psalms as well one of the most well-known psalms begins the lord is my shepherd i shall not be in want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters he restores my soul when we talk about god and when we talk about what it is that God desires for our lives. What's God desire? To lead us beside still waters. Serenity, peace, calmness. God is a God who desires for you to rest. The Lord is my shepherd. Here's a familiar psalm by David. What has he discovered? What's he putting into words? The truth that he's discovered about God. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the one who is leading me, who is restoring my soul. Whenever I read this, the Lord is my shepherd, it makes me ask a question. Which shepherd is leading me? Who am I allowing to lead me? Am I being led by a shepherd that is taking me more and more into going and giving and giving and giving without receiving? Is my shepherd like the energizer bunny that just keeps going and going? Or am I being led by a shepherd, by a God, whose desire is to restore my soul, to fill me with life? to lead me. See, the picture I get here makes, makes me lie down, green pastures. It's like throw a towel out in an open field, throw on some bronzer, <laughs> and just soak up the sun. Get a good book. He leads me beside still waters. It's a picture of rest. Yeah, this is the God that we find throughout Scripture a God who desires for us to be alive, to be filled with life, to not be like that pickup truck that was just sputtering, running on fumes, but to be able to go up the hills that life will bring, to go around the turns and to keep on moving. But in order to do that, we have to allow ourselves to be led beside the still waters. We have to allow ourselves to be okay with resting. 
ceasing, taking it easy, lying down on green pastures for a day, for a season. Sometimes you need longer than other times. Sometimes you need two weeks or a month or a week, whatever it might be, to just be, to be still and to shut it all down so that you can re-engage with the work that only you can do. And we all have our work. There's specific work that each one of us, only us, only we can do that work. But in order to be your best self, the self that you were created to be, the self that God longs for you to be, you have to allow yourself to be led by the shepherd of rest so that your soul can be put back together from all the nicks and the chunks that get taken out of it during the week. Now let's turn to one more scripture verse. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Here is Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Anyone here this morning? You need to hear that. You're feeling a bit weary. You're feeling a bit burdened. And you could use that divine rest. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. As we surrender, as we open our palms, the promise that Jesus gives is a promise of rest. Is this not what we just read in the book of Psalms? David discovered this truth. It's a truth that is still for us today. Jesus continues, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anyone here this morning, you've what's been placed on you, you've allowed heavy yoke to be placed upon you, a weighted yoke. And right now, this morning, you're being weighed down. It feels like there's all this weight upon your back. You're carrying it with you. You can feel it every step you take. It's as if you're walking underwater. The invitation of Jesus is to bring it all to God. Bring your burdens, your weights, the things that have been weighing you down, that are depleting your precious energy, and lay them down at the feet of Jesus. As we close this morning, I want to celebrate something that we haven't done in a while. And for me, it feels way too long because this practice, it is at the center of the Christian faith. This practice, it's at the center of awaken, of why I do what I do. And it's the practice of Eucharist, the good gift of Jesus. Now, obviously today we're not going to have everyone come forward and take the bread individually and dip it into the cup. So if you're at home watching this, I want to invite you to take some wine, some grape juice, pour it in a cup, and then grab some bread. Take that bread, dip it into the cup, and then partake. And what this signifies, as we do this, as we engage this practice, it signifies our coming to Jesus. 
our coming to Jesus with all we've been carrying around with us. Everything that's in our suitcase, everything that we've been dragging in that duffel bag behind us. We bring it all, we lay it at the cross, and we trade it for rest, rest for our souls. Jesus is the perfect Sabbath. So as you engage this practice, as you participate in Eucharist, the good gift of Jesus that was given for the life of this world, for your healing, your salvation, for your forgiveness. This is a picture of grace, of gift, of the rest that God desires to bestow upon you. It's a practice that reminds us we no longer need to carry everything that weighs us down, but we can trade it for a yoke that is light. We can trade the heaviness for lightness. So my prayer for you this week, my friends, is that you would find rest, that you would allow yourself to find rest. You would give yourself permission to rest, to lie down in green pastures, to be led by the shepherd of rest beside still waters. That as you partake, as you take the bread, you dip it in the cup and you partake, that you would feel the heaviness lift off your shoulders, that you would truly hand off all the weights and all the burdens, that you would place them at the foot, at the feet of Jesus. And as you do so, you would find a lightness that restores your soul and brings life to your bones. May the grace and peace of Christ rest upon you this week.